I'm on the Sunshine Coast in Australia at the moment. That's not not a bad place to be. <laughs> it's not a bad place at all. I I'm beginning to to question it maybe a little, but I th- think that's just because I've been I've been here for so long. It's I came over in December last year and uh, <laughs> haven't left. I'm starting to get itchy feet. How long had you been based over here for before you shifted over? I'd been there for it. It will be nine years in September. Just gone. Oh man, quite a big change. Then. It's a big change. It's it's all COVID induced. I'm actually going to be back over in um in England as of January next year. It's just a better place to kind of sit this out, and in theory, a better place to be writing as well. Yeah, things aren't being handled um too well over here at the moment. Things are a bit chaotic. So I hear. I haven't been keeping up with it too well, but I catch kind of secondhand news from my friends when I speak to them. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of under a rock at the moment, it seems. With yeah, things being so chaotic and, and horrible at the moment, kind of being away from it and escaping it a little bit isn't isn't the worst thing in the world to do. Oh, it's be- it's beautiful. I mean, my family's here. Uh, the sun's out. The uh, laws aren't too stringent. And there's actually no case... Oh. <laughs> I think very minimal cases, like one or two in the state where I am. So um, life is pretty much as per usual, just I can't leave the state. <laughs> it is a bit of normality though. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's really good. It's kind of like being 18 again. Is that why it's a, a better place to write as well, just that normality? Or Yeah, as I said, in theory, it's a great place to write. In reality, it seems that uh, you kind of need that. I don't know, stuff going on around you and culture moving and I've kind of got a feeling of regression. I'm staying with my family and it's, yeah, I've had plenty of time to write but it's very difficult to be inspired by what I'm creating at the moment. But I feel like I'm coming out of a slump actually so maybe I'll reserve judgment for the next couple of months. Do you know, what's your kind of perspective of your writing when you're in the middle of it? Are you able to tell quite easily if you're not happy with what you're creating or is that something that kind of comes afterwards once you've got a bit of perspective from it? I've always thought I'm generally... I'm a pretty pretty good at my quality control. So I write with a good friend down in Melbourne and I always have even when I'm in England for my own stuff. Normally if I like something, I'll send it down to him and ask him what he thinks more as an ego massage and then when he says it's good, I'm then certain that I like it. But normally I th- I think I know if something's bad. I I don't really finish songs that I don't like. So in that sense, I'm quite a slow writer because I just ditch everything that I don't like. How far in will you get before you kind of, you know, leave it by the wayside and realize there's no point in impress- pressing on with it? Well, sometimes even even it'll just be a, a chorus idea or a um a verse groove, and I'll kind of re- record a vocal and a few parts, ba- like throw down some bass and keys and stuff, and then I'll be like, this sucks, and probably delete it, <laughs> which is not a good idea. I think it's probably something I need to get over, but I really, when I don't like what I create, I have to get rid of it. <laughs> There's something interesting about that and the same with that creativity is so ephemeral and the way that you're kind of just getting rid of stuff as soon as it's done and it's not working and it kind of keeps you pressing forward and, like you say, gives you that slight pressure. Yeah, definitely. I, I like to be excited by the song that I'm working on. So I guess that's really what I'm looking for. Maybe even more than whether something's good or bad is subjective. So it's more, am I excited by it? <laughs> is, yeah, how I get to the end of a song probably is more a realistic way of putting it. When did you first realise that you were creative and that you you know you enjoyed creating things i think i wrote my like first song and like recorded it myself when i was probably 15 15 or 16 i'd say bought myself like an old tascam 8 track and i was using a a road nt1a and i remember figuring out months into recording that there was a little gold dot on it that meant that was the front of it and i'd been singing into the back of it for months <laughs> And wondering why it sounded so muffled. <laughs> 15, 16. What sort of stuff were you listening to at that point? Or what was it that kind of pushed you towards that? What was kind of the music that was pushing you to write a song at that point in your life? So I remember I was, I'm was i like classically trained and I I didn't even listen to contemporary music, I'd say, until I was probably 15, which is kind of crazy. I just enjoyed I loved Liszt and Beethoven and Rachmaninoff and I just listened to beautiful piano pieces and um I think the kind of first artist I started listening to was kind of like kind of guitar revival stuff like The Strokes and Interpol I I remember loving as a as a kid and that was kind of the first stuff that got me inspired to start making music. When you were classically trained is that do you think there's still elements of that that kind of carry through now and the stuff you're creating at the moment? I think surely in some in some way like whether it be how I approach chord progressions or 
I, I feel like every mel- every melody here in the course of your life is somehow kind of locked into your subconscious and and feeds into your kind of sense of melody. Does that make you more cautious of what you listen to then? <laughs> if if everything kind of feeds into it in a subconscious way? Um, no, it doesn't. But I always I do think that though. I think if you I I listen to music when I love an album, I'll destroy it for myself. I'll listen to it over and over and over again. In that in that way, I've kind of digested the album, and it it can be kind of spat back out again later on in in some in some form, you know. But no, I'm not particularly conscious of what I listen to. If if I like it, I'll keep listening to it, and if I don't, I probably won't listen to it again. What album has kind of changed your life the most? This sounds really corny, but I just I remember when Viva La Vida came out. I just loved it. It was the first time I'd I was very late to the fashionable music trend, and I remember hearing that with like Brian Eno's influence and just the kind of expanse of sounds and stuff. And I remember that really exciting me at the time. I can't remember how old I was then, but kind of in recent years, like first time I heard Deer Hunter, that like, that was kind of one of the artists that put me onto the the lo-fi kind of train. I've kind of been delving down that direction ever since with plenty of other artists since then. But yeah, I thought Deer Hunter was a really cool artist when I heard them for the first time. You know, when you discover these artists and you kind of, you absorb their influence and and you spend time thinking about them, has what music needs to do to be successful for you changed? Has that developed with time and evolved? Yeah, I th- I think, I've listened to music in two capacities, actually. Um, I either listen to it when I'm looking for specifically creative inspiration, and I'll listen to kind of anything that might inspire me rhythmically or just instrumentally. Like, in that sense, I guess I'll listen to music in a very kind of mechanical way but then I I do love a beautiful melody and and lyrics so yeah I guess I'll listen to it in the car or something I'll be just chilling to I've been loving the new that or it's an old old record now but that Kazma Coombs um Mangy Love record listen to that on repeat at the moment and I guess that in, is inspira- inspirational but I kind of just like it <laughs> but then like I've got a weird little um Spotify playlist at the moment that's None of the artists are particularly ones that I listen to, but for for recreational fun. But they they all kind of inspire me with how the songs are put together, or like yeah, the instrumentation and stuff like that. I've I've got a friend who does a similar kind of thing where he has a playlist full of albums that he feels he should listen to in his life, like albums that are <laughs> yeah, considered that's a good classics. way of putting it. Yeah, I was just gonna say there's a lot of artists that you you suddenly realize like you know someone would talk about a a record and you'll be like you know like one of Paul McCartney's records or something and you'll be like I've never listened to that I feel like I feel guilty for, as a musician not hearing that so I'd better um I better get that on a playlist and <laughs> know that I've listened to that so yeah there is all, I think there's a sense there. of that <laughs> yeah there's too much man for sure when did you first I mean the influences that are kind of infusing this this upcoming EP at what point in your life did you kind of come towards then the kind of the 70s kind of you know piano bass driven stuff like Elton John and that sort of thing at what point did they enter your life? I only f- really got my like I he- literally my fingers on them like two years ago because I I started actually playing them because I'd never really I'd heard them of course but sometimes I decide to play songs that I like and I remember playing um like I saw the light by Todd Rundgren or like a couple of Todd Rundgren songs actually and um when I started playing the chords I was like man I've never ever written a song with a chord like that in it and it kind of it was exciting to find something new like that so I basically just started writing this project straight off the back of kind of discovering a new arsenal of chord progressions and a different flow to melody and things like that yeah that pretty much it was it was pretty fresh about two years ago I think when you when you started playing those songs did you notice things about them that you hadn't when you just listened to them just playing, like, can I give you a slightly different perspective? How does it affect the way you feel or, or think about them? Yeah, I, I have a pretty close... I feel like chords really, they can tell a story without the lyrics. So it's, so I have a pretty close affinity specifically to chords. And when I find, I don't know, a new progression or something like that that makes me feel a certain way, I really jump on board with them. So I, I, I kind of, yeah, found a couple of different chord progressions there that I thought, these are these are really exciting. Like, I... I could really put this into my music and it also takes me away from the I sometimes struggle melodically if I'm not inspired by what's underneath the melody. Did the rest of the music kind of fall into place around that in those chord progressions? Did you kind of did, could you see in your mind what you wanted 
or hear in your mind rather what you want the rest of it to be yeah def- definitely with the f- those five songs that are on this this coming ep it was um it all came pretty easily i don't know they have they have a kind of sleazy it just makes me smile when i play those chords uh, um and chuckle to myself so i i kind of wrote that album or the ep very freely like kind of whatever came that that made me laugh or i thought that's <laughs> that's pretty random or I would just go with it. I don't even know if I put that much thought into it, really. I probably did, but it seems to me now in, in hindsight that it just came really easily. I think you can kind of, you get a slight sense of that in terms of the, the spontaneity of the music as well. Like it, it it feels like an EP that could kind of go in any direction when you listen to it for the first time. Like it kind of twists and turns a bit throughout the different song structures. Yeah, it was a lot of fun definitely to make. And I'm I'm already feeling that off the back of that, I I now need to kind of refine again for a, a new EP but that was definitely like a, a good little chunk of time that just all those songs just came together and they all they all feel like they're in the same world or at least the same headspace um, that they were written from. What, when was that they were written? How long was the kind of time frame? Because me and my my friend Jeff we we kind of produce as we go it, it kind of can end up a slow process but I started probably two years ago actually I started writing this this project the, the first conception of this project started then and um i probably finished writing the ep a a good a good year ago and then it was kind of getting it mixed and we my friend mixed it and we're going back and forth so that stuff takes a long time when you're doing it by yourself and you get really precious about getting it right (laughs) so yeah it's a it's a long process on the on the back end more than the writing was pretty quick i think probably yeah probably six months all the songs were done writing wise and then it was just a long process from there. Did you just have the five or were there other songs that were kind of kicking about at that time as well? I've got a few it was probably like two others that I thought were kinda of cool, but again I didn't like them as much, so I never I never finished them. I I might go back to them again for future times, but who knows? Yeah, just a pair of fresh ears and kinda of see see if you notice something different. Exactly. About them. Yeah. At what point did the the idea of like kind of T Truman enter the picture as well? Would you would you say is T Truman like a moniker? Is he a persona, or how would you kind of describe? T Truman was kind of uh, and that was pretty early on in the process. I thought doing a solo project, do I want this to be Tim Lanham does something, or do I want to keep it removed? And because it kind of it felt so on the nose, and it it felt humorous, I um I kind of felt like lyrically I needed a kind of used it as a scapegoat having a an alter ego. It makes writing the lyrics for something like this much easier. Where you can kind of say what you wouldn't say if it was if you had to be accountable to it as Tim Lanham. So I could kind of lean into some more self-deprecating lyricism and it just seemed easier to do that way. And I think it fits in now with this kind of created this character and this idea around the rock and roll and then the song coming out Born to be Right is kind of an outline of some of the traits of this T. Truman character. Has he evolved with time as well? The idea for what he was, did that kind of develop in tandem with the song? Yeah, definitely. Because um, when I started doing it, it was immediately like harking back to the 70s. And I, um, I don't know, I'm very aware of the kind of the mainstream music that is doing well now and what, what kind of young hip people are listening to. I'm aware that th- this doesn't fit into that of music particularly. So I kind of had this idea developed of this this musician who was resentful at the world for moving on without him and he wished that he'd had his his shot at his career kind of 30 40 years ago it's interesting as well because you can you can see the influence of quite a lot of this music in the mainstream it's just it's kind of taken on a slightly different form maybe a little bit watered down a little bit more nicely yes yes definitely a more minimalist and so i was just listening to the new yellow days record and it sounds so modern but it's got huge influences from the 70s which you can obviously hear in it but it still sounds really modern it can be interesting to do that though and take those kind of those core timeless things that work so well and put them in a slightly different setting and just see see what kind of effect it has yeah it's really cool really cool so i mean with this project as well you're, you're obviously involved in a few different you know creative outlets for yourself are there aspects of yourself that you're tapping into with this that you aren't with the others i think i have like my own natural writing tendencies regardless of what I'm writing for, but I think maybe I, f- I funnel um, definitely a different attitude into all of them. I don't think that I can kind of compartmentalize my kind of innate writing. It's just a it's just a mindset. So naturally, when I write with Justin, where it's a different outfit, and I 
I think differently when I write with that. If you pulled apart all the songs that I've been kind of heavily involved in, there's probably some sort of theme that you can hear through it. I don't know. I don't know for sure. But I don't change much except for my kind of attitude, really, when I'm writing. I guess it can depend on your bounce off as well. Like your bounce off with Jeff on this and it kind of brings something different to the the process the the one thing that's different is when it's your own project you can just throw kind of ridiculous ideas into the mix i don't know there's definitely some sort of liberation to doing something where you're only accountable to yourself and that's been probably the best fun with this and it's like if i want to do a, a ridiculous guitar solo that i almost think's cringy i'll just go for it and then i would never have ended up with that otherwise with a with a kind of more serious attitude to songwriting so i think it, it it's definitely liberating having a, a solo outlet I, I think it's really good for any musician whether they release it or not to be doing that yeah you can take some more risks yeah for sure what do you feel is the biggest risk you've you know you've taken with the cp in this project the biggest risk is with doing a solo project is is how you position yourself in the world as like that indie guy or you know that that guy who plays 70s music or that hip hop artist or that trap artist or whatever i could i could have been any of those obviously i have my leaning which is what i've gone for but i think that's the biggest thing is when you finally decide to go out on your own you can kind of say to the world who you really are when you're outside of any pre-existing parameters i think that's the biggest risk is just in a sense said this is who I am at least for the time being will it impact your songwriting going forward now that you've done that it probably will because I kind of think that once you create a brand if you stick with it unless you're extremely prolific your tastes change faster than you can change a project so you've kind of got to honor the the brand of your and the the world that your project exists in going forward so as I said it takes so long to when you do it all yourself to get the a record finished that by the time it's finished you're not no longer listening to those artists and when you start writing the next one though you've got you can't just be jumping all over the place with what your influences are and what it sounds like if you're taking a year per ep or two years per lp so yeah i think it will affect my writing down the line what do you do then with it you know with the influences changing so quickly and you should like you said the taste evolving what do you have to put in place to keep something focused and sure that you've got that sense of perspective to know that it's it's cohesive and kind of all takes place in the same soundscape. I think you've got to be, you've got to be kind of, you've got to really funnel your creativity into a world and be be clear to yourself on what you're trying to write. And I think that's why side projects always pop up and pop up and why artists are in so many different bands because they feel like, you know, even bands that barely see the light of day and you find out some artists been in like six bands before they broke, it's because they feel kind of bound to their pre-existing project and they need to break free again so i think it's just being true to your pro- your project and trying to make it as kind of trying to marry it to where you're at as well in the best way that you can um and i think it's just being smart with your writing if you can repa- like repackage an idea ag- like in the world that your project exists then that's great but it, yeah as i said it's, it's really difficult so yeah I, th- I think it's just being being smart as you start writing and knowing where stuff fits I mean, I know, like, Justin, when he's writing, he's got, like, five, six different playlists of, of music that he's written, and this is a vaccine song. Is this something that could be for Halloweens? Is this something for a, a new project down the line? Like, you, you can't write every song to fit your, your project's needs. Yeah, I guess it can sometimes be detrimental to the song itself as well if you want to try and, you know, bring it into a project that it just doesn't exactly. fit for. Um, I think that's a huge thing. I sometimes think about that just listening to just songs out there from different artists is i think to myself if that was written by another artist i probably would feel differently about the exact same song it, it's so interesting how you can interpret music sometimes yeah and like the completely different you know shape a song can take on i remember on um, the last car seat headrest record that came out earlier this year there's a different version of one of the songs in the streaming version a different version on the cd and a different version on the vinyl all the same song but just done in this completely different kind of format and style so cool. the possibilities are, are endless yeah yeah I was going to say, at what point do you stop thinking of a song as like an individual thing and part of like a bigger a bigger body of work, whether that be an EP or a record? You should start thinking of it as a part of a bigger body of work Like once you're trying to push it over the finish line. Um, I always start songs hoping that they're just a standalone smash hit. And then once you start to get over it and you're recording parts for it and you've been stuffing around with it for a while, you can you can kind of accept that maybe it's got a got a place on a record and 
that is a cool thing about doing full records is you need just track eight songs and it's all part of the the journey of a record so um yeah i'd say if you're writing a fantastic song it's just that it, it can just be a smash hit from the start and a single and then it's probably best to start taking a different approach to a song if you're not so sure of you know it's standalone capabilities but it's strange as well when you listen to a record sometimes the songs that are you got growers you got like slow burners so you you got to give every song there a good chance, I think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's interesting with, with Holiday on this EP as well, is that that by itself, that was the first single you put out, right? Yes, yep. It feels like both the perfect introduction to the EP, which I guess is why it came out as the first single, but when it opens it, it's like this this infectious, you can kind of get this infectious burst of energy. It feels almost like excited to introduce people to like the, kind yeah. of the palette. Yeah, check me out. And what, in, the, in the soundscape. Yeah, it's definitely like that. Did you have like parameters for, for what you needed the soundscape of the EP to be? Like in terms of sonically, what you wanted it to sound like and the textures that you were going to play with across the five tracks? Because there's a real sense of, you know, cohesion with it. Well, this was an easy one because I really wanted to explore that inverted commas, like piano sing songwriter, like singer songwriter or that piano music. So that as an instrument ties it all together pretty, pretty strongly because there's plenty of piano out there, but there's not a lot of piano music um, written in like piano pop almost written like this is so I think that kind of helped tie it all together but then the other thing is just I think being conscious of the the drum sound really as long as as long as the drums are kind of constant throughout it it's I feel like the sound of a drum kit can put a song you know in the 90s or in the or in the 60s a lot of that comes down to the sound of the drum kit so we spent a lot of time like thinking about references particularly for that and that helps put everything in the same world can it take quite a long time to get that sound exactly as you need it do you, do you hear it in your head how you need it to be i do I've, i'll hear like a, a snare drum who was it uh this french artist junior uh or how have you said junior she has this song a la plage and i heard this like snare drum on that and i was like oh my goodness it's that sounds amazing and that was like i was trying to replicate that drum sound when I first started tracking the drums and then you kind of just work with what you've got I mean it's all all home mixed and you've you've got kind of certain limits to capabilities so you kind of at the end end up with your own sound anyway because you have your own process and like Jeff has his own way of mixing and his own way of interpreting that so once we had a sound we kind of just rolled with it how long had you known Jeff before you before you worked in this project so we went to school together so oh, man. yeah like 14 years or 15 years probably so the, the trust was kind of already there before you went in and worked had you worked together before yeah so we we had like a band back in the day we moved to London together to start a new band and we like spent two years there just hanging out and making music and going to parties and stuff. And then his visa ran out, so he went back to Australia. We'd made a lot of music together and plenty of time making tracks, deleting tracks, vetoing each other. So we got a pretty good working relationship. Was moving to London something that was always kind of on the cards for you as well? Was that something that was always in in your head that you wanted to to do? Yeah, I mean, coming from the Sunshine Coast, I always romanticised a city like London and all the history that it has, like, musically and... Also, in, in every way, I remember kind of getting to 18, 19, and the idea of just moving down to a um, metropolitan city in Australia seemed like an unappealing prospect for me. So, yeah, I think probably from 18. I, I think I moved when I was 20, so from 18 probably. I wasn't really thinking about it when I was at school or anything, but, yeah, definitely somewhere I wanted to be to pursue music. How did that, that culture shift affect what you were writing and kind of immersing yourself in that new place? Did it have an impact upon the songs you were creating at that time? I think it, it definitely matured the songwriting and just meeting other musicians and being immersed in kind of subcultures and other bands around. I remember like meeting those um, Australian dudes like Splash back in the day and like hearing their music and thinking it had like a very specific sound and kind of just learning to hone hone sounds and make songs and projects exist in a in a kind of sonic space and in a world and i know you're speaking there but or you were speaking a wee bit back about the the desire to kind of romanticize london and get across that place did it change the way you looked at the gold coast once you shifted over was yeah i think it did actually it seemed like everything was just so much faster the world just moved so much quicker in a in a big city and the options felt just at arm's reach or and it felt so far away thinking about being somewhere like um sunshine coast to make to make music and be in a be in a band and things like that it seemed almost um 
adolescent or something like that, at least pursuing creative um, endeavors. I guess there's a sense of excitement kind of comes from that as well. Yeah, like definitely, kind of definitely. With the, the video for Holiday as well, that was self-directed by yourself, yeah? <laughs> yes, yeah, it was. <laughs> when did when about did you go around filming that and what was that idea kind of where was that coming from it's uh it's something <laughs> so that was kind of in the peak of lockdown when i filmed that i don't know where that was just some some madness i just used what i had at the house and my uncle had left an old um, vhs camera here so i was like i'll use that that'll be vibey have this old desk here so i don't know this whole like ron burgundy kind of news reporter guy came to my I don't really know wh- why <laughs> why it was like that but it made me laugh so I yeah, um I went through with it and I had my sister holding the camera and I was kind of like no no hold it a bit closer to me or whatever <laughs> and then I got this program to edit it which I thought was one of the uh whatever the kind of industry standard one is but it's this dodgy program that crashed every 4 minutes so it took me weeks to edit it and it was definitely a learning curve, and I had a, had a lot of fun with it. But I was I was happy to have it done. I guess it definitely shaped the aesthetic of Truman a lot. Was that was that shot before or after the rock and roll video? That was before. It, it's got some kind of tone to it, not in terms of the the style of it, but more just emotionally. Like it's kind of, it's that same kind of very self aware character building. It's interesting. I've I've seen I've spoken to a few people who've taken it completely literally, and it's funny to me that people wouldn't see the humor in it but i guess that's part of the fun as well the thought that people could be out there being like this guy this guy is is tragic (laughs) (laughs) when you're making like a music video and you're you're experiencing and or experimenting rather in that kind of different art form are there any parallels between the questions that you ask yourself when you're making a video and when you're making a piece of music or are there any noticeable differences there probably are yeah i think you want to you want to come across as the same guy who's made the music I think it it's the same theme in tr- in the Truman lyricism, which is that it's kind of a safe place, kind of tongue in cheek, self deprecating humor, where you can kind of say a truth but kind of bury it, like nuzzled in amongst a kind of joke. I've definitely used that same attitude with with the videos, but then another part of videos is just does it look good or does it not? But I guess again with sound, does it sound good? Does it not? So yeah, I, I guess there's a lot a lot of parallels really. Was there anything you learned from making the video that you kind of then thought about in terms of music? Are there any lessons that carry over? Not not particularly. No, I think they're almost like two different worlds in my head. I'm doing a music video and I'm in music video mode and I can't think of anything else until I've got the final edit done and then I'm back in songwriting mode. It's actually, that's been a huge challenge for this project probably more than anything else is like switching hats between getting photos sorted, sending out emails, making sure you're on schedule to release. And it's very difficult to retain that humble songwriter, free-flowing mind, sit down and just write a song today when you're also like, oh, I've got to do this email. Oh, I forgot to send that to this guy. And it's definitely been a frenetic turn for me. In, in my approach to musical projects yeah you kind of you having to switch between that music business side of things and the you know the creative and the artistic with rock and roll as well the kind of grand you know centerpiece of the ep we were speaking earlier about when you were starting to get into those bands at the strokes and interpol when you were like 15 16 was the allure of rock and roll something that kind of drew you towards music and that style of music yes i think it was i um because it's all in the past and it's all great stories now from whoever you you hear on an interview or but some of the films that you see about it it just looks like a different world and it it looks like something that's unattainable and i think i think that's part of the that's part of the allure for any listener is is trying to be a part of this this kind of universe and just just kind of touch the hem of the garment of these kind of guys that live in somewhere between here and heaven there's a part of that that's kind of fed into well, yeah, the the joke when writing rock and roll, kind of the disillusion of creating music, and actually for for any band, it's incredible, but also it comes with its you know lows as well. There's an incredibly dark side to it. Yeah, there is, and it's it's just aside from addiction and all of that kind of thing, it's just the disappointing reality that it's still just life. It's still the same life, you know, on the other side of the curtain, which probably gets a lot of people. You know, you kind of follow the carrot dangling in front of you and then you realize you're where you dreamed of being and still 
profoundly unsatisfying in some way. What can you do to be for? What do you need to be fulfilled then and be satisfied if, if that idea that was maybe something you're always striving toward doesn't always you know provide that? You've got to take pleasure in every moment when you're when you're writing and really find your joy in your in your art because I remember a, a playwright saying. I was on a podcast I listened to recently that his favorite moment when he thinks about like going to theater and thousands of people coming to watch his, his kind of grand creation, the best moment always ends up when he thinks back to it is the moment you created that amazing story idea or that amazing character. And it's, it's the same with songwriting, really. When you think back, the, the most special moments are when you know you've created something that you love and you've got to make sure that you log that away and, and cherish those moments because they are the the reward and it's not it's not like release because release day comes and then you're like oh i released the song two months ago and nothing seems different so you've kind of got to cherish kind of each moment that feels exciting to you yeah it almost becomes more about the experience yeah exactly what what moment then and what experience would you say that you're most grateful for that you that you've had within this project yeah yeah sure i remember being really really excited with um this new song coming out, Born to Be Right, that was that was the first song actually that we, we wrote for this project. And I did that one with Jeff and we kind of, I think we did nearly the whole song in one day. I was like, never made anything like this before. It sounds so cool. And I was just so excited to be, felt like a jockey out of the, out of the blocks just on a new project. And it was really liberating. And I don't know, I felt bright eyed and excited about creating. Yeah, I kind of want to bottle that I know it's really hard to do, but kind of keep that attitude going into any any songwriting. I think you can really hear that in the song. Like, although it has that slight, you know, self-effacing humor that you were, we were speaking about earlier, it's it's an incredibly kind of joyous, bright offering, and it has this sense of almost adventure about it, kind of an excitement. Yeah, it definitely does. It's each of those things, I'd ne- I'd never written a song like that before. I'd written songs with rock and roll chords and all the kind of indie tricks in the book, but I'd never sat on the piano and just boshed out a a groovy bit of fun yeah it it definitely is kind of exciting and and really honest where about were you when you you wrote it was in australia i'd come back for just for a holiday for like a month or so i remember playing the chords to the the verse of born to be right and um voice memoing it and then had a writing day with jeff and i and we just chucked that into a session and it just kind of came so easily and it was just a lot of fun. Another one of the things I really love about that song is the the piano tone, you know, the piano in it. It's just oh, it's so gorgeous. What are you trying to capture with that? Are you trying to get like the spirit of, of that initial recording or what are you looking for when you're trying to locate where you need the piano tone to sit? Actually, I find piano really difficult to, it can have so many faces to it, piano. So I wanted that kind of bright stringy sound to it and it's, it's hard to get piano to when you're playing so much like so heavily and so f- fully in the um in the piano part it is hard to get it to sit in a mix where you want it so i just wanted that kind of bright cutting sound but also yeah it's a hard line to walk because it, then you kind of sound like you you're playing like a a casio or something that's just cl- clanking around so i actually used friend studio in in London and I just took the fronts off and got the mics as close to the strings and hammers as possible get that kind of punchy really forward kind of sound it's fascinating how that then bleeds into some parties as well because it's it, they're similar tones but the uh, you know as we were saying born to be right is incredibly joyous and some part it's just very kind of you know slow melancholic finish like it's taking a similar tone but looking at it from a completely different point of view yeah again some party was that that really thin piano sound again and because it could have easily been that really mellow the somber damp tone but yeah i really wanted to keep that yeah i guess cheerful tone to the piano and it, i mean it, i guess it bleeds into the idea of the whole ep whole ep being this you know this one immersive thing as well and that kind of escapist quality to it yeah it's funny the word cheerful seems to arise from this which i feel like lots of musicians want to want to be told they sound deep and um, reflective or something like that but I think it's good it's good to be creating some something that people can feel a little bit of cheer from and yeah it's funny because I've just started working with a, a manager um, he's from Scotland actually you're but, on uh, Kingdom now yes yes with um with Hamish and he he was saying he just showed his parents and they were they were so happy that he was finally um managing an artist who was playing cheerful music so <laughs> <laughs> it seems to it seems to be something people take away from it. 
it's good to have that slightly different emotional emotional side to it. Yes, yeah, definitely. You you wrote the uh, riff for Loretta in a hotel room as well. Where where were you traveling? Where were you traveling when when you were writing that? I was with the vaccines, and we were supposed to be playing a festival in or just outside of Venice in Italy, and it got completely stormed out. So we had like two days off. Actually, a really nice little town. I had this. I've got it here now. It's tiny Akai, like it's only an octave and a half keyboard. I kind of started messing with that that riff, and because the p- keyboard's so small, I had to put the riff together in like three different takes. But yeah, that that's where it that's where it was kind of conceived, and then over the next couple of weeks, fit the rest of it together. But yeah, it was a, it was a funny place to come up with that. What what role does traveling have in creativity? You know, when you're in that headspace, what kind of an effect does it have on what you're making? You can really feel the change in atmosphere and mood when you when you um, arrive at a new city. Like sometimes the only difference when I think back to a city it, like, from memory is the is almost like the feeling like you get inside, like being in like, say Moscow as opposed to Spain. Even if you're just on a, sh- a nondescript street, there's some some sort of feeling that comes with a new place, and I think you can kind of carry those feelings into your songwriting and the mood that you're in comes through with how you write a how you write a song and i think it's i don't know if that's something that everybody experiences but it's such a cool thing that you can you can get a feeling from a place that you can't get from anywhere else in the world are there places then that you would want to go back to because you've managed to get a feeling from them that was incredibly you know fulfilling to channel into your music yeah def- definitely i mean i loved i loved um bangkok i would go back there in a in a heartbeat that very similar to that Mexico City, these kind of places that feel still metropolitan and full of kind of modern modern life, but also like unbridled and unregulated and you feel like anything could happen. I love that kind of, it's almost like explosive and you don't know what's what's around the corner. Yeah, just that sense of excitement. Like kind of what we were speaking about with London earlier on. Yes, exactly. I think big cities will always have that. These kind of um, a little further afield cities, or at least to my mind, they seem to kind of offer an un- unknown um, element that you don't get in, in somewhere like London or even New York. Yeah, certain places have a rawness about them. I mean, Mexico, I'm, I've never been, but I imagine from what I've seen, of it, it feels like it has that kind of atmosphere. Yeah, and it just feels like, for, for better or for worse, it feels like people could get away with anything if they wanted to. Knowing that kind of maybe feels, you, you, you're kind of scared in some way that you don't know what's, you know, what's down some street or whatever it is and it it kind of it's kind of thrilling i guess i guess fear is a big part in songwriting as well or plays a part to some degree yeah definitely fear probably plays into a huge part of any breakup song it's like fear of rejection and fear of not finding that love again it's been written about it time and time and time again so yeah i think fear is a, a huge part of like one of the deeper human emotions that are drawn from for profound songwriting. What's the easiest emotion for you to channel into songwriting? Or that comes most naturally and songs just kind of flow out of? Some form of, for me, the word would be frustration because I'm naturally uh, not introverted, but submissive in nature. So there's a lot of things that go unsaid in my life that you naturally become frustrated about. And on a general, general scale, that's what I draw from, frustrated about a situation that happened 10 years ago and you can kind of draw from that feeling in some way or yeah and also because creativity is such a release it's it seems like the natural antidote to frustration is to be released from it does songwriting help you communicate these things that you can't that you sometimes go on said i think so i but i i don't think that it needs to be communicated to anyone else except more like i feel like i've shouted it out to the world and that's all that i really needed does it give you a sense of closure then in some way with what you didn't say? Does it help you kind of move past that once you put it into a song and you've, like you say, shouted it out to the world? Yeah, I think it does. It's it's actually never really thought about it, but I think it's quite remarkable how it, it does it. And it feels like you've got your own little poetic... I think I said for like rock and roll, like this song is like a tear shed for like, you know, my frustration for lack of success in this um in this genre. However much of a joke that is, it's nice to know that you've... You've put the effort in and you've, you've said it in a, in a way that you think's beautiful. 